So this is DLD, right? So D stands for digital, is that right? Life and design. So I don't really know everyone here, so I want to get to know you a little bit. So digital, are you a digital person? Raise your hand. Everyone isn't, you're on digital? <laughs> okay, that's okay. Who identifies with the word life? Come on, everybody, life, come on. Come on, you over there too, life. How about design? It's a very designing. Well, Hans Ulrich epitomizes design and writing about design and art, by the way. And when he asked me this question, it was 6.30 a.m. in a terrible hotel in London. And what he does is he's a unique person because he carries a tape recorder everywhere he goes. So imagine a person you don't know that very well, but the first thing he does is he pulls out a tape recorder and says, let's talk and have breakfast. And when he asked me this, I have to say that I used to be a very digital guy, but I've gotten kind of tired of it. And I'll just start there. Ask me questions from that. It sounds perfect. And you were actually mentioning at that time, you know, uh, when we met in this terrible hotel in London, you're mentioning not only, you know, your own work, but you're mentioning the kind of work of your students. And it's kind of interesting because we obviously, you know, are going to have a whole new generation of artists here who kind of grew up with the digital. So I was kind of wondering if you can talk a little bit about uh, this ongoing uh, project you have, uh, you know, you basically uh, decided to reinvent the school because we heard Michelangelo before um, and maybe, you know, in waiting for Zaha we can connect to the previous speech. I think that could maybe be a good way because Michelangelo, you know, founded a school. It's an artist-run school um, in uh, Biela, the Progetto Arte, um, and Maya Hoffman together you know, with the car group and Beatrix Roof is here, um, is in Al, you know, founding uh, a project which is uh, not a museum project, it's a project which involves art in many different ways and it's also going to be a school. Yeah. Now you as, yeah. you know, one of the leading, you know, uh, designers and thinkers about design uh, in the world have decided to actually give a lot of energy to this idea of a school. And when we spoke in London, we talked about uh, Alexander Donner, but we also talked about the Black Mountain College. And I think it's kind of interesting following up on my uh, and Michelangelo, if you can talk a little bit about your vision yeah. of that school. Well, what I think is great is that people really feel a need to learn again. You know, we, we, we did a lot in the last two decades, and now we're trying to figure it all out. And, you know, when I heard about Michelangelo's school and Maya's school, those schools are examples of what I call like a, a startup school. They're startups. They start fresh. Um, whereas my school isn't a startup. I call it an end up. You know an end up? So you can be a startup or you can be an end up. And, and I don't mean that in a bad way, of course. Like you can say that um, Europe is an end up. The US used to be a startup and now it's an end up. An end up is a very valuable thing because it means you're stable. It means you've stood the test of time. An end up is great. Startups want to become end ups. But as you know today, end ups, large corporations, large institutions, want to act more like startups. And it, there's dissonance in that. So what I find so interesting, to your point, is, I mean, there's also the work, um, do you know SALT in Turkey? It's another kind of institute as well. There are these new cultural centers forming. They are startups. They don't have a business model. Um, and they're fascinating. But I don't want you to lose faith in the end-ups. Because the end-ups, I think, are going to get very interesting. Now, how do you see the kind of uh, generation of your, of your students and how would you describe what's happening right now, you know, 
within your school? Because obviously, yeah. you know, we're going to hear a lot later tonight from artists on the panel we're yeah. doing with Simon Castets, who, you know, are of the same generation as, you know, uh, uh, artists who, who study with, with you now, who have just graduated. And I kind of was wondering um, where you see uh, the developments, wh yeah. what's sort of happening, what these students are yeah. working on. Well, I think it's very hard um, for anyone who is trying to enter the field today because this digital thing has really kind of messed up one fundamental thing. And that is, as we all know, you don't get to finish anymore, right? We all love books, even today. Why is that? Because we get to finish it. We all love making a painting, because we get to finish it. Anything digital, you never get to finish. That's a feature, that's, a, that's an advantage but you don't get to finish it. And because you can't finish it, you can really never be fully happy, I think. Um, and I say that with great respect for digital people, by the way, me being a digital person too. But I noticed this 10 years ago, that on top of that, not only is it not finished, it is so easily replicable. It is so easy for someone to press the exact same keys as you did to make the exact same thing. You know a great virtuoso you know, violinist or a pianist can take a piano, the same piano someone else played, and make it sound better. The same with a violinist can make it sound better. People who play the computer, even the most virtuoso people, are making the exact same thing. And that bothers me. And I think it's going to bother more and more digital creators. And how do you then see the kind of, uh, you know, situation in terms, of your, in terms of your own practice? Because when we met last time in London at that hotel, you were saying that uh, uh, you actually, uh, at that moment, had to stop to type. There was a kind of a break in typing. Um, and uh, I was kind of wondering how you, uh, what you're working on at the moment. Could be great to hear. Well, first of all, again, I love digital things. I also hate them. Let's get that straight. Secondly, I think that design in this century is becoming increasingly important for one simple reason. And that reason is that we now consume design at a different quantity level. In the past, when you would design something, you would design an endpoint. You would design the thing that someone would experience, and it wouldn't change. But now, because we design things that keep on changing, that have so many views and facets to it, you need design everywhere. So design, I think, is going to become naturally more important. The question is, will it become better? Will it become more interesting? Now, going back to your question of what I'm fascinated by, I'm fascinated by politics, uh, people, uh, community, uh, how people are probably the most difficult medium to master. Um, so who here is a designer? Can you raise your hand? Designers, designers, graphic designers, anything. Good, good. So you over there in the pink shirt, pink. What kind of designer are you? Graphic, industrial. So he is an interaction designer. So he gets to fit into a category where he can fit anything. So he's a lucky person. Who's a traditional designer? Traditional graphic designer. Come on, I see older people here. I'm a graphic designer. I admit it. <laughs> There's no one who's a graphic designer here. <laughs> wow, you guys all died. Oh my. Uh, well, anyways, from the perspective of a graphic designer, I love making things. And when you make things out of paper, what happens is you get complete control. You can cut the paper, you can crumple it, you can make it, you can put two pieces of paper beside each other, you can do anything you want. And the paper will just do it for you. But I think of, as you know, People don't work that way. People aren't a, a material like that. 
So I see design as being so pivotal in understanding how do we develop communities and organizations? How do we use design in that category? Uh, specifically in leadership is what I'm uh, involved in now. Now our last question is, uh, we've spoke, so actually we discussed this also in London, but then run out of time, so I really wanted to ask you about your dreams, your unrealized project. I mean, you were mentioning your books, you know, your writing, you were mentioning your own design practice, your, your passion or your love for making things. You were mentioning, you know, your um, uh, teaching uh, vision. I was kind of wondering, looking at all your achievements and all the things you've done, what are projects which have been too big to be realized, too small to be realized? Maybe dreams, what's your dream? Oh, um, I think I told you then yet, but I don't have any dreams anymore. It's not a sad thing. Um, I have one goal in life, that is to live for tomorrow. Um, let me explain. Um, when I received a call to become president of my college, I thought maybe they were too early because I thought, I don't, I can't do that, that's impossible. But I said, okay, you know, my, my mentor called me up. Uh, he's a graphic design person. And he said to me, and he was uh, 76 at the time, his name is Mitz. He said to me when I got this job, he said, John, don't forget that life is lived in four quarters. And I never heard this at the time. Have you ever heard of this? Four quarters. Zero to 25, you're a baby to 25. 25 to 50, 50 to 75, 75 to 100 years old. He said, John, don't forget, most people don't make it to the fourth quarter. It's like, oh. And he said, third quarter, it's not easy at all. Your body begins to deteriorate at a faster rate. Second quarter is where you can make a, a real difference. So you gotta make use of it. So, my project is to see if I can make a difference in just the second quarter right now. Great, John. Thank you so very, very much.